Welcome to our OpenSIM webinar. My name is Jennifer Hicks. I'm the OpenSIM project manager, and I'll be serving as the moderator for the webinar today. Today's presenter, Matt Damaris, will describe and demonstrate how to estimate joint loads in OpenSIM. OpenSIM is a freely available software package for biomechanical simulation that's used by research teams around the world. The first goal of our webinar series is to showcase this cutting edge research. The speakers will also provide insights on how they used OpenSIM in their research process. With the webinar series, we also hope to provide an easy platform for OpenSIM users to communicate and collaborate since we have a growing and geographically diverse user base. Before we get started, I have a few reminders about the webinar format. Questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation using the Q&A panel. If you need additional technical help, you can also consult the guide uh, that's in a PDF on our website. And now I'd like to introduce Matt Demers. Matt is a graduate student in mechanical engineering here at Stanford University. He's an expert OpenSIM user who is investigating how our joints are loaded during movement, a topic he's going to discuss today. All right, great. Thanks, Jen. <laughs> When we use our bodies to move and perform tasks, our joint tissues carry loads that affect joint function and their health. Quantifying these loads is one of the most important and challenging problems in biomechanics. With that in mind, OpenSIM has tools that can help you do this. And my goal today is really just to show you how some of these tools work and how to use them. We can't preserve individual health and mobility without preserving joint health. We have to understand the function of the joint structures and the physical demands on them. To design a successful joint replacement, for example, like this total knee replacement you can see here on the left, we have to prevent failure in these components by anticipating the loads they'll operate under. Biological joint tissues, like the articular cartilage um, in the uh, femur and patella, like you see on the right, also operate under loads, and that can lead to injury. Measuring these loads directly is difficult and invasive. So one alternative is to actually use models to represent our musculoskeletal system and then calculate estimates of in vivo joint loads. OpenSIM has a tool to do exactly that, and we call it the joint reaction analysis. Joint reaction is a method that takes a model, its motion, and the forces applied to it, and then calculates the reaction forces and moments that result in the model's joints. I'm going to collectively call these forces and moments joint reaction loads. The analysis also gives you some convenient options for choosing how to represent the joint reaction loads it reports. You can set all this up and run a joint reaction analysis through the OpenSIMS Analyze tool. So today I'm going to talk about joint reactions in a two-part discussion. I'll start with a conceptual overview of how to estimate joint loads during gait. And after that, we'll change gears and do a demo live in OpenSIM to show you how to set up and run a joint reaction analysis. This picture is the schematic we're gonna be building during the conceptual portion. I'm using 2D drawings for simplicity, but keep in mind that these really represent large 3D OpenSIM models that can have complicated geometry and many components. On the left is a musculoskeletal model. In this case, it's just a pelvis and an articulating leg. This limb model contains rigid segments representing bones, joints that describe how the limb articulates, and also muscles that can apply forces to move the model. Modeling gait will also usually have ground reaction forces applied to the feet. To analyze a specific part of the model, like the knee joint loads applied to the tibia, which is blue here, we'll actually use kinematics and muscle forces we learned from this complicated model on the left and apply them on a small scale local model um, to calculate the reaction loads at the proximal and distal joints. So let's start by describing what a reaction load actually is. Let's say we're studying the knee joint, which in this model is an elliptical joint where the tibia rotates and translates around the femoral condyles. We want to know the load that the tibial plateau feels. So we'd like to cut apart the joint and maybe put in an instrument to measure the load across the tibia femoral joint interface. If we look at the tibia moving in space around the elliptical joint, we see that the muscle forces can cause motion around this joint, but also act to pull the tibia up into the femur. As a result, the femur will produce reaction loads that prevent the tibia from penetrating this ellipse, but allow the tibia to rotate and translate around the ellipse. 
the instrument embedded in the tibia would only measure these loads that constrain the, the tibia to the motion around the ellipse. And these are what we call joint reaction loads. In order to calculate load estimates for human walking subjects, we need to know some key pieces of information first. We need to represent the structure of the subject so we can provide a model that describes the geometry, the bones, and the joints in the muscles. We need kinematics that describe the walking motion and external forces that the ground applies to the feet. Finally, we need the muscle forces actuating the model. And with all this information, we can calculate reaction forces resulting at the joints. But unfortunately, we can only obtain the first three components from anthropometry, gait analysis, or other measurement methods. We can't directly measure in vivo muscle forces. And instead, we'll have to estimate muscle forces before we can calculate joint loads. OpenSim actually provides several tools for estimating muscle forces, and the joint reaction analysis can use results from any of these tools to calculate joint loads. Today, in, in today's demo, we'll only be focusing on static optimization to estimate muscle forces before we calculate joint loads. With static optimization, you specify a, a model first that represents the subject geometry. You also provide joint kinematics that describe the motion of the model and also external loads between the feet and the floor. As output, static optimization then chooses one possible distribution of muscle forces that produce the measured joint kinematics. It also uses a muscle model to estimate activations that would produce these muscle forces. So with that, we actually have a complete description of this model, its motion, and the forces that produce this motion. So you could say we have a full description of the system's dynamics, and we can now proceed with calculating joint loads in the joint reaction analysis. The joint reaction analysis is essentially a post-processing method that traverses the model and calculates reaction forces and moments in all the joints. It starts with the most distal segment of each limb, in this case, that's the foot. All external forces and muscle forces are used to calculate the resultant load at the proximal joint, which is the ankle here. It then moves up the limb to the tibia segment and uses the equal and opposite ankle load on the tibia and all other known forces to calculate the reaction load at the proximal knee joint. So similarly, this analysis continues up, to, up the limb, moving up the limb segments, using the previously calculated reaction load at a distal joint to calculate the reaction load at the proximal joint. So now that we know that the joint reaction analysis traverses all the joints to calculate joint reaction loads, let's look back at the knee joint and see how the joint reaction analysis calculates the reaction load on the tibial plateau. For this calculation, joint reaction isolates the body distal to the joint of interest. In this case, that's the tibia. It's then going to construct the six-dimensional Newton-Euler equations of motion. And this is kind of like building a free body diagram with the tibia moving in space. So we'll take a little bit of time now to construct that diagram. From the model kinematics, we can construct the kinematics of the tibia in space. So this gives us the linear and rotational accelerations of the tibia about its center of mass. So those of you wondering, these accelerations include velocity terms like Coriolis or gyroscopic accelerations and also give us the inertial forces for the body. Next, we'll collect all the applied forces that act on the body and set them equal to these inertial forces. So first we have the external forces acting on the body, and these could include things like gravity, or if we're talking about the foot, this could be ground reaction loads. But in this case, this is a tibia, and we don't have any ex externally applied reaction loads that we could measure with a force plate. Then we use the static optimization estimates to add muscle forces acting on the body. You can see these muscle forces are very important. So the accuracy of your joint reaction loads is gonna depend very much on the accuracy of your muscle forces. In this simple case, there aren't any constraints acting on this tibia, but in general, a model could um, apply constraints and by applying constraints, it applies constraint forces to the bodies. The joint reaction analysis will take these constraint forces into account by adding them here. Since joint reaction has uh, already calculated the ankle reaction load on a foot, we can actually add the equal and opposite reaction load to the distal end of the tibia. And finally, all that's left is the proximal reaction load at the knee joint. And the six components of this reaction load are now the only unknowns in this vector equation. So we can actually rearrange this and solve for the knee reaction load by calculating a vector difference between the inertial loads and all other applied loads acting on the tibia. And all those applied loads here are what you see in the parentheses. 
So now that you conceptually know how to calculate joint reaction loads, I'm going to talk about how to set up a joint reaction analysis to do this for you. The most important guidance I can give you is this. I can't stress this enough. You need to provide exactly the same information you use in static optimization. It's important to use the same model, the same kinematics, and the same external load that you use as inputs to static optimization. If you use residuals or reserve actuators defined separately from your model, you must take those into account as well. If any of these are omitted from your joint reaction analysis, or maybe they're not consistent with the settings that produced your muscle forces, the equations of motion won't be consistent and the reaction loads you'll calculate will be meaningless. After that, you have options specific to joint reaction analyses. First and most importantly is the option for specifying a file that contains the time history of muscle forces. And this is actually how we'll apply our static optimization results. Next, we have some options for specifying the joints you're interested in, as well as how to represent the reaction loads that are reported. And I think these will actually be easier to discuss in the demo. So I'm gonna actually um, go into those in more detail later. If all goes well, OpenSIM will perform a joint reaction analysis and then print a single file containing all the reaction loads. And that file looks like this uh, string at the bottom. Is, it has a suffix of joint reaction underscore reaction load. And that's just to remind you if you come back later that this file was produced by a joint reaction analysis and also that uh, the results you're gonna be looking at are reaction loads. So with that, I think it's actually time to move on with the demonstration. Um, I think it's the best way to show you how to actually interface with joint reaction analysis. Before I start, I wanna say that this isn't intended as a follow the leader exercise. And instead, we'll post all these working files from the demo for you to reference later. Also, we'll be using some helpful documents with guidelines for using the joint reaction analysis with static optimization and also with other tools. We'll post these as well, and you can refer to them later when you're sitting down and setting up your own studies in the future. And remember, we're gonna be leaving plenty of time for questions after the demo. All right, so um, let's switch gears here and we'll start opening up our, all of our documents and windows for doing some analysis. So first things first, I want to orient you to all the things I have open and kind of the environment we're going to be working in. So first is our OpenSIM window, the GUI window, and this is where we'll be looking at our, our starting files, like our model. Uh, this is also where we'll set up all of our analyses and choose our options. We'll also run the analysis through here, and finally we'll go back and look at our results and actually spend some time talking about how to validate these results and make sure you have some confidence in their accuracy. So um, after that, we actually have, uh, I'm gonna share my Explorer window just to show you what um, the environment looks like, what our starting files are, and where the results we printed, things like that, kind of just infrastructural stuff. And finally, I have this document open, and it's really a version of the help document we're gonna publish to you guys later. And um, it's actually just some helpful checklists, like a checklist for performing static optimization, and a little lower, a checklist uh, for performing joint reaction analyses from a static optimization. And then after that, that, actually just some, some figures and some helpful uh, illustrations to orient you to how OpenSIM represents joints and how you can use this understanding to uh, hone in on the representation you want to use in your joint reaction analysis. So let's get started and just look at what we're talking about today. So we're going to have a subject represented with a model here, and this is a gait model with a torso, pelvis, and two legs. It has 23 degrees of freedom and 92 muscles. And those of you familiar with OpenSim might have seen this in the example files with your distribution. You can go in to your OpenSim installation and go to examples, gait 23 92, and you would see this model there. And we're going to be using basically that setup. And once we're done with this, you can basically take that information and use this demo to calculate reaction loads for that example file. So if we take a look at our files, what we're starting with is actually um, some results where we have some kinematics here. We have ground reaction forces. We have our model. I've already prepared a, a setup file for static optimization. We have some actuators we're gonna append. And I've already computed some results for static optimization. So let's go in and actually open up the Analyze tool and show how these were set up and how we're gonna transition from our static optimization results to our joint reaction results. So we're gonna to go to tools up at the top, go down to analyze near the bottom here in the scroll list. 
And I'm going to load, by going to settings, I'm going to load some settings for static optimization. And at the bottom, you see setup underscore static underscore optimization. So I've loaded that in, and by doing that, I've automatically set up my kinematics file, which you can see here in the middle. Uh, my time range that I'm interested in, half a second to two seconds. My output directory. If I go here to the actuators and external loads, you can see that I have some actuators set up here that are going to be appended to the model. So basically that means that the muscles that you see in the model will still be there, but we'll also be adding some additional actuators. And um, I'm not going to go into why we need these or why I'm using them for static optimization, but what you do need to focus on is that if you use these in your analyses, like static optimization or other tools, you have to make sure you use these actuators when you're doing joint reaction calculations. Otherwise, your model won't be consistent. We're also going to be applying external loads that we provide from force plate measurements. We're doing that just with the setup file for representing external loads and how they're applied to the feet. And finally, if we go to the Analyze or Analyses tab, you'll see that we have one analysis defined, and it's a static optimization analysis. And I can highlight that analysis and click on Edit down here at the bottom. And you'll see more options for static optimization. I don't want to go into these, but I do want to point out one that's very important for joint reaction analyses, and that's the step interval. So the step interval basically lets you decide um, how many steps you want to skip in your kinematic data uh, and when you're doing your muscle force estimations. And this is useful if you have very high resolution data, like you have many time steps in your calculate or in your uh, data sub files, and you'd like to uh, not estimate muscle forces for all of them, so you can, in this case, skip every nine and do only the every tenth, um, tenth calculation, and we'll do that. But since I'm doing this for static optimization, I need to make, remember this setting and make sure I use it when I'm doing a joint reaction analysis. Okay, so we've done that. This is all set up. I could actually hit run right now and OpenSim would happily go away plugging a way to calculate muscle force estimates with static optimization, but I'm actually not going to do that. It would take a few minutes. And in the interest of time, I'm going to skip that and then focus on options for joint reaction analyses. My biggest tip for actually, um, for actually setting up a joint reaction analysis is to use the settings you've already set up to start your joint reaction calculations. So let's take a look at what that is. When we're setting up a static optimization settings file, we want to provide a model, kinematics, a time range, maybe some extra actuators, external loads, and such. And when we're setting up our joint reactions from static optimization, we want to set up the same files, still the same model, kinematics, the same time range, or maybe a subsection, the residual actuators, external loads, and then the force data from static optimization. And one really easy way to get all that set up for free without any hassle and making sure that your setup is very consistent is to just use your settings file for static optimization and modify it for joint reactions. So I'm going to do that now. I'm going to go to the Analyses tab and highlight static optimization and hit Delete. And in, in its place, I'll go down here to Add, and about halfway down, you'll see Joint Reaction in the list, and I'll add that joint reaction. So what this has done is I've now gotten for free all my setup files collected in one spot. I already have my kinematics and my external loads and my actuators, so I don't have to worry about making sure they're consistent. And I can now just focus on setting up my joint reaction analysis. So I'm going to highlight the joint reaction analysis and hit edit. So in here you'll see more options. We're going to skip the last three for now, and we're going to set up the two we absolutely have to have. So for, first off, I'm going to show you the minimum settings you need to get joint reactions running with static optimization. So the first one is to remember our step interval that we use in static optimization. And if you recall, we actually use a step interval of 10. So I'm going to set up that step interval now. Next, actually, is an option called the forces file. And this is that file that lets us uh, specify multiple forces we've estimated somewhere else and use them and apply them to calculate joint forces. So this is where we'll actually specify the results of our static optimization analysis. So what I'll do is I'll go here to my Explorer window, and you'll see I have a results directory where I've already pre-calculated these muscle forces. So I'll go into the static optimization results. At the bottom, you'll see a file with an ending underscore force, and that's just a file with columns containing data of muscle forces. I'm going to highlight the name and copy the name, and I'm going to go back to my settings window. and. The way you specify this file is to just give a relative path and the name of the file. So the location relative to my working directory is just results static optimization. 
and I should spell it correctly. There we go. And then a a forward slash and I'm just going to paste in the name of that file. And I'll just check it real quick. Is the name looks correct? Static optimization underscore force. And also we have the directory static optimization results. Cool. So this is the minimum we need. And for now we're going to ignore all the other options. We'll just use their defaults. I'm going to hit OK to save that. And I'll save these settings so I can use them later. So I'll save settings. Maybe I'll call it something easy and short. Set up JR. Something like that. So set up JR or XML. Hit save. And I should be able to just hit run and it should work. So here you can see it's adding the forces objects. It's appending uh, external loads to the model. We're executing, we're appending muscle forces, and it's calculating the joint reactions right now. So if you're watching, uh, we're already finished calculating joint loads. Um, that took roughly a second, second and a half to calculate, not including loading the data. And the thing to know about that is actually most of that time was spent animating this window. So all the CPU time to and graphics time to draw these 3D geometries and the muscle paths and things like that. If we actually ran this in the command line or closed this GUI window, the joint reaction portion would actually calculate extremely fast in a few milliseconds. So basically that means if you want to add this to your other studies, or you might think you in the future might be interested in joint loads, I'd just go ahead and add this analysis because it doesn't cost you anything in time. It's, it's basically um, going to be just as fast as it was before. So I would, you know, if you're interested, just go ahead and add it. All right, so supposedly we have some joint reaction loads sitting somewhere. So I'm going to go look for those. I'm going to close my analysis window. I'll go back to my results directory, and you can see we now have a new file, subject one, joint reaction, reaction loads. All right, so we've calculated something. But now that we've calculated something, let's talk a little bit about what that file looks like, how you can read it, and also how to validate the results. And to do that, I'm going to use the plotting tool. So I'll go back to OpenSim, and I'll go to the Tools menu and Plot. I'll go to the Y quantity to choose what I want to plot. I'm going to load a file so I can load my results file. I'll navigate to my results directory, and the first file there is my reaction loads file. So I'll double-click that and open it. Let me expand this so that you guys can see a little more of it. All right, so what you're seeing here is um, a list of all the columns in this data file. So each of these names is really just the name of a column that happens in this joint reaction results file. So if I scroll down, you'll see that there are actually joint loads for every joint in the model reported here. Each joint load is, and I'll stop scrolling here so you don't get dizzy, um, each joint load is actually six components. So if I look at the knee, for example, this knee load has three components of the force and three components of the moment acting on the right knee joint. So let's look at the name for a second. The first thing in the column is actually the name of the joint. So it's hip underscore right. That's the name of the right hip joint. So you know exactly which load we're talking about. And then next it says on femur right. And this might seem cryptic, but really for any joint load, you have actually two loads. You have the load that one body applies to the other body, and then vice versa, the equal and opposite load applied the other direction. So you have the ability to choose which one you're interested in, and in this case, the default was to choose a femur. You can also choose how to represent the joint load in terms of what basis you use or what reference frame you use to represent these vectors. And so here it tells us that the vectors are expressed in ground, and that means that these three force components are components on a reference frame associated with the ground. Okay. So the reason we do this is so that if you come back to your results later, sometime in the future, and you want to look at them again, there's no question what they mean. You have immediately some guidance for how to interpret these numbers. They're not just numbers associated with the hip. You know exactly what joint they're associated with, which direction they're being applied, and in what basis this vector lives. So um, with that, let's talk about how we validate the model. So I'm actually going to close this um, and return to the model to show you some of the structure. So if you look at our model here, um, basically it consists of a tree structure that starts with the pelvis. So we have the ground, and the first body in the model is this, is this pelvis body you can see here in the middle. And from there, the torso and the legs branch off of this uh, pelvis body like a tree structure. And what that means is the first joint in the model is actually 
the ground pelvis joint. So the ground pelvis joint is just a free joint. It's free to move in free translations and three rotations. It can move anywhere in space. So since it's free to move in any direction, this joint shouldn't be applying any reaction loads between the ground and the pelvis. It should be free to do whatever it wants. So if we go look at the reaction load calculated for the ground pelvis joint, it should be zero. So let's do that. Let's go to plot again. We'll open that same file. We'll open my joint reactions file here. And I'm actually going to select the six components of the ground pelvis joint's reaction load. I'm going to choose one I'm going to plot those against. I'm going to plot them against time, and I'll add them. And you can see that they are exactly zero. This is a really great sign that my estimates of joint forces are correct, at least correct for my model and my muscle forces. So what that means is when I started here calculating joint loads at the ankle and then use the ankle load to then estimate some load at the knee and then use that knee load to estimate some load at the hip and then keep working up the model back to the pelvis, all of those steps are probably correct because all those loads had to be correct in order to get the zero load I expected. So I've used some physical intuition about my model to, uh, to make sure that the whole sequence of my calculation has been uh, appropriate and has been consistent. So with that in mind, I actually have another trick for checking on uh, my joint loads and gait models. And it's another way of using my physical intuition about the model to validate my results. So what I'm going to do is actually take a look here closely at the hip joint. So if you look at the hip joint, you can see that it's basically a ball and socket joint. What that means is it's just a uh, the femoral head here is a ball rotating in the socket that's, that's located on the pelvis. So this ball and socket joint lets the femur rotate freely in three directions. It's not going to restrict any motion of rotations, but it does restrict translations. It prevents the, the ball of the femur from penetrating the socket of the pelvis or also from distracting away or pulling away from that socket. So basically what that means is the joint can't apply any loads to resist the rotations. And instead, all rotations will be caused by the muscle forces. That means that if we go look at the reaction loads for the hip, they better have moment components of zero. And if they don't, that means our model probably isn't, um, our, our joint loads aren't correct for this model. So I'll go back to the plotting tool again. And I'm going to open the same file again. And instead of plotting my ground pelvis joint loads, I'm just going to plot the last three components of my hip load, and those are the, the X, Y, and Z components of the moment. All right, so I've selected those. I'm going to plot them over time. And here they are. And yet again, they're exactly zero. So again, this is a really great sign. With some physical intuition, I've shown that um, for my calculations, when I applied some muscle forces to some kinematics, the joint reaction loads are something I would expect from my physical intuition. And so now I can trust that the other reaction loads in my model, like the forces for the hip and the forces in the ankle, represent what was happening in my static optimization analysis. So um, as long as my muscle forces are good, my joint reaction forces are good. All right, so we talked about how to validate our results. Uh, and now that we can trust our results, let's go back and talk about how to refine our joint reaction analysis with a little more detail. So I'm going to go back to the tools and analyze tool, and I'll load the same joint reaction file I saved earlier. So I'm going to go back out of the results directory, and I save this setup.jr file. Okay, so I still have all the same settings set, the kinematics, external loads, and stuff. And I'm going to go back to my joint reaction analysis, and I'm going to hit edit. So earlier, we just set two really important variables, and then we ignore these last three options. And these three options are basically lists that let you specify what you're interested in and how you want to represent the loads you're interested in. So the first list is actually just a list of joint names. And you can construct a list of all the names of the joints by name, just by the string of their name, and specify what you want to, what you want to see. And joint reactions will only print out and display to you the reaction loads for what you specified. So the default here is all. It understands the keyword all. So if you provide that, it will just do all the reaction loads. But we're going to get a little more specific. Let's say we wanted to look at the right hip. I'll specify that by name, so hip underscore R. And uh, that's my first load. Maybe I also was interested in the left ankle, so I could do ankle underscore left, something like that. 
or maybe also from the back joint. So I could add to this the back. I'll just type in back here. So once I've done this, it'll actually perform the same analysis. It'll still traverse all the joints in the model, and then it'll only report the loads that calculated it, the hip joint, the ankle joint, and the back joint. So next, we actually have three more, uh, two more options for apply on bodies and express in frame. And these let you control which of the joint loads you're interested in and what frame to express these vectors in. So to explain that a little bit better, I'm going to actually refer to my document and go down to this illustration that kind of describes how joints are represented in OpenSim. So in OpenSim, uh, using this tree structure, a joint really is something that lets you add a new body to your model. So if you already had a model that existed, it already had this green body in the model, and you want to add some other body, you would then apply, you'd then add this body by specifying a joint between this child body and the parent body. So every joint then has two bodies associated with it, as the parent body that existed before and the child body that articulates relative to this parent based on this joint definition. So just like the joint has two associated bodies, each of these bodies is applying a reaction load to the other. So, for example, if this was uh, a tibia here at the bottom in blue and the femur in green, you could ask for a joint load in which the load was applied by the, the tibia onto the femoral condyles, or vice versa, that the femoral condyles were applying onto the, the tibial plateau. And joint reactions let you specify which of these you're interested in. It also specifies them based on the location of the joint in these bodies. So every joint has a location in the two bodies it's associated with. It has a location P in the parent and a location C in the child. And the joint kinematics are really just any simple or complicated description of how these frames fixed on these bodies move relative to each other. So what we can actually do is joint reactions will actually report the reaction load at the location of each of these points. And you might be wondering, well, there's a little offset here. There's a translation between these points. And joint reactions actually takes that into account. It'll use the equivalence principle to calculate the equivalent load as if uh, this translation was taken into account. So what we can do is um, let's, look, let's reduce our set of joint angles or, or joint loads really quick. Maybe I'm not interested in all these angles. Instead, I'm actually interested in um, checking that my hip loads are correct. So what I could do is maybe look at the hip load that's applied to the femur and also the hip load that's applied to the pelvis and make sure they're actually equal and opposite. So what I'll do is I'll delete the back joint. And instead of having hip right, or sorry, ankle left here, I'll just add a second request to show me the hip right loads. And this is perfectly fine. You can add as many of these as you want. Um, if you wanted to look at the same load or the same joint, but different loads in that joint, or maybe the same load in that joint, but different representations, you can do exactly that. OpenSim uh, allows for that. So now I have two loads specified. They're both going to be hip right loads, but maybe there'll be different loads at the hip. So what I can do is choose open up the supply on bodies tab, and you'll see that the default here is child. So that means that by default, the analysis will calculate and report the load that's applied to the child body. And in that case, that would be the load on the femoral head. So maybe we want to have that one uh, still be the child load. And instead, we want to compare it to the load applied to the pelvis. So we're going to actually just type in the keyword parent here. And these are your only two options for the apply on bodies list. You can either choose child or you can choose parent. Um, and it'll, it'll report the load that is applied to the child or parent at the location of the joint in these bodies. So now we've um, specified which loads we're talking about when we talk about hip loads. But we also need to decide how we're going to represent these loads. So if you look here back at the illustration, you can see there's some there's some kind of intuitive reference frames that we could be representing this load in. We might want to represent the load relative to the anatomy of the parent body. So maybe there is some reference frame like P0 here that is meaningful to the definition of the parent. Or maybe there's another reference frame fixed on the child, maybe the origin reference frame of the child. And you might want to represent the loads relative to that. Another example might be you might want to plot these loads in space, or you might want to display them in the GUI, and you need to have those loads reported as vectors in the ground frame to do that. So you can also specify to report them as vectors expressed in the ground. And the joint reaction analysis actually supports all these options. So you can see here the default for the express in frame is the ground frame. But I could actually just uh, change that to anything I want, just as easily. I could put in child here, 
and then I would get the load expressed in this vector, which is the in this reference frame, which is with these vectors expressed in this origin frame of the child body. Another option would be to do parent, and then these would be vectors that are expressed in the pelvis body. So I'll leave this one as child, and I could, you know, put this one as parent so that we have a parent load that's expressed in the parent body's frames. But since we want to compare the hip loads applied to the femur and to the pelvis, maybe we want to subtract or add them and make sure they're actually different or they're equal and opposite. To do that, we need them to be in exactly the same reference frame. So what I'll do is I'll actually just put child here twice. And what that means is I'll be reporting two loads for the hip, but they won't be the same load. They'll be actually equal and opposite loads, hopefully they'll be equal and opposite loads. There'll be different loads, though. There'll be a load applied to the child and a load applied to the parent, but I can express them in exactly the same reference frame. And you can do this mixing and matching however you want, and joint reactions will support all of that. All right, so I'll set this up, um, and I'm going to save it. I'm going to hit OK. And maybe I'll save this as something different, like Joint Reactions 2 or something convenient like that. All right, cool. So I saved it. I'm going to hit Run. And yet again, it's loading all the kinematics. It's loading the external loads. It's loading the muscle forces. And it's now calculating joint loads. And it's finished. All right, so just to make sure this did what we asked it, let's go back and plot these results. So I'm going to open the, uh, the plot tool again. I'll go to the Y quantity, and I'll load a file. Go to the output again. So we've basically just overwritten the file we cracked out of before, but that's fine. I'll expand this again. And you can see now, instead of having all the loads reported for the entire model, we only have 12 components here. It's the six components of the hip load applied to the femur and the six applied to the pelvis. If we look at the name, you can see here that um, we st in both cases we have a hip load. And just like we asked, the first one is the load on the femur and the second one is the load on the pelvis. And if you look at the frame they're expressed in, both are actually expressed in the femur frame. So what I could do is um, go in here and, and grab the uh, forces, for example, that, the, that are applied to the right femur and I'll plot those. All right, so now we're looking at the, the forces applied to the femoral head, uh, and these are the forces applied by the pelvis to the femoral head. And you can see they have this kind of characteristic peak at both, um, at both heel strike and right and that's representative of the ground action forces as well. This is what we'd expect for a hip load. Um, Without a little more detailed analysis, we can't tell whether these are really uh, reasonable for our subject. Uh, but one thing we could do is we could compare these to instrumented joint prostheses measurements, for example, or um, other other calculations. Uh, but really, the only measurements we have are are those instrumented prostheses. And um, you might say, well, maybe these are high, maybe these are low. Um, are they correct? And really, the answer is for the muscle forces I estimated and for the model I chose, these joint loads are correct. But if you're concerned about their accuracy for your subject, the place you need to go iterate some more and, and do a little more refinement is to go back and look at your muscle forces and decide if, if this is a strategy you actually want to use to estimate muscle forces. Or maybe you want to use a different strategy. All right, so we've calculated some hip loads. And with that, I think we're actually going to conclude the, the demo portion again. And I'm going to leave you with a few final thoughts about this, about this uh, demo we just taught you. So basically, I've started with a conceptual overview of um, how to estimate joint loads in OpenSim. We've also discussed how to calculate joint loads in OpenSim using a joint reaction analysis. And we've done a little bit of work to do a sanity check to validate the results and make sure we have some confidence that they're correct. And I know the demo went by pretty quickly, um, but actually you can go download a self-contained example covering exactly the same material I've just shown. It contains setup files for running static optimization and running a joint reaction analysis on a walking trial. You can find it on the OpenSim project page at simck.org under the download section. Also, if you want to download the help documents with checklists and illustrations that I was showing you, um, you can navigate to opensim.stanford.edu and then go to the web page for this joint reaction webinar. You can find them there.
keep in mind that I only showed you how to use static optimization and joint reaction analyses together. But you can also use joint reaction with other OpenSIM tools. Um, so to help you learn more about these approaches, we'll actually be posting more health documents and demo materials in the future very soon. As participants today, you'll also automatically receive a follow-up email that describes how to find all these materials in more detail and also how to provide feedback for us. And with that, I'm actually going to hand the reins back over to Jim. All right. Thank you, Matt, for a great talk and a great demo. Uh, before we start the open question and answer session, I have a couple of quick reminders. Um, first, please fill out the survey that's going to appear in a pop-up window when you exit the event. This will help us improve future webinars. Uh, we'll also make a recording of a webinar available this week on our website, um, and you'll get a follow-up email, as Matt said, with more information. Um, the Open Sim, if you check out our Open Sim website, it also includes a schedule of upcoming webinars, which will include a talk by Catherine Steele about simulating pathologic gait. Open Sim and this webinar series are supported by several grants from the NIH and the EU including an NIH grant that funds our National Center for Simulation and Rehabilitation Research. Um, information about the center, upcoming events, and other resources for the OpenSIM community are available at our website. Uh, and with that, let's get started with the Q&A session. All the questions will be text-based, so go to the Q&A box accessed on the bottom right of your screen, type in your question, and make sure you select that it's going to um, ask all panelists. Um, and with that, I'm opening the floor to questions. Okay. I'm not seeing any questions coming in yet. So first, uh, you use static. Oh, oh wait, there's a chat question that's come in. Um, so I, I want to remind you, though, that if you'll answer questions on the Q&A. But the first question is from Andrew Anderson. Uh, he says, thank you for the talk first, Matt. Uh, one question, um, can you visualize the force vectors on the bodies, or is this done only in the plot? So right now, um, you actually can visualize, visualize your data. So there's actually a, a tool in the GUI for visualizing marker data and visualizing ground reaction force data. It's kind of set up specifically for for providing just two forces a moment, so just the, the right and left foot floor forces. Um, but you can actually use that if you only want to want to plot or display two loads. So I've done that before, and what I've done is I've done my joint reaction analysis on the hip, and then do a body kinematics analysis that, that gives me the point or the location of the hip joint while this model moves through space. And then I just have a MATLAB script that takes that um, point and the force and moment from the reaction load, and it makes essentially a, a ground reaction load data file. And I can then take that data and use the preview data feature to actually synchronize that data to my walking motion. And I've used that to make some really pretty um, videos and movies of my mm -hmm. model walking through space over a treadmill over ground with their hip loads animated right on top of the hip joint. So I know it's kind of a workaround. Maybe we can think about um, a more intuitive interface for including joint loads. But this is what I've used in the past, and it should be pretty easy to use, I think. Okay. Uh, so the next question is from Luca Modenis. Sorry for the pronunciation. He asks, without a torso segment, would you have forces between the pelvis and the ground? So you, um, you wouldn't have forces between the pelvis and the ground that are felt borne by the ground pelvis joint. So um, when you don't model certain parts of your uh, subject, like you don't model the arms, you don't model the torso, we do have some kind of uh, some extra actuators, residuals and reserves that can take up the slack. And those are the actuators that would actually take up the difference of um, whether you have a torso or not. But the joint reaction load wouldn't take up that difference. It would still assume that it can't apply any loads uh, to move the pelvis around as long as you're using um, engineering-like actuators, like a, like a motor or a, a prismatic linear force actuator, that kind of thing. So the answer is it shouldn't matter as long as you're using the same types of actuators you're using for your other gate models. You'll still get a zero load between the ground and the pelvis. All right. Another question 
from Valeria Gritsenko. Uh, the question is, is it possible to use EMG to constrain static optimization for the estimation of muscle forces? Uh, yeah, um, so the tool in, in OpenSim, the one on the GUI, doesn't let you do that. It only knows how to uh, minimize a cost function that's just the sum of activations to some power. Uh, that cost function at the moment doesn't include a difference of EMG in your activations. Um, but some of us have been, have been working on doing this in kind of our own API program. So you can actually use the OpenSim API to write your own optimization. And I've been doing this. I'm actually working on doing something similar. Um, but in terms of what's available through the GUI, uh, and that's really hashed out and been tested and as uh, test cases and done some error checking, there's nothing like that in OpenSim right now. But there's nothing to stop you from, from trying to do it in the API. And maybe in the future, we'll have a more robust and a more extensible optimization options available through the GUI as well. All right. So another question. So from Pauline Bruce, she asks, uh, first says, thank you for the talk, and how do you define where the joint force acts? Okay, cool. Um, so the, I'm actually, if you can hopefully still see on my screen, I'm gonna actually go back and show that picture I was using. So your model actually uses a structure like I've shown here to specify the structure of the joint. And it basically has some things associated with it. And so the, the joint description, if you go look at the joint description in your model, will have some important features. It'll have this location and parent, which is the, the point in the frame where the uh, joint is located on the parent body. And then it also has the location of the joint in the child body. So the reaction analysis doesn't actually let you choose any arbitrary point on any body. Instead, it only gives you some convenience features. So what it lets you choose is one of two options. It lets you choose the load applied to this location specifically, so to the location of the joint in the parent. So if you choose the parent option, you'll actually get this load that's located at this frame fixed on the parent. And in your options, that looks like location and parent, I believe, if you open a model file. And then if you choose the child option, it'll actually apply the load on the child body that would be applied at this location, which is the location parameter of your joint definition in your OpenSim model. So you only have two choices. And when you choose one load or the other, it automatically chooses which of these points it's gonna be defined at. Okay, the next question from Kara Lewis. Uh, is there a way to calculate the joint force due to muscle only, uh, so ignoring the component from the action force? Um, Hmm. It, we don't have an option for just explicitly ignoring it, but you could always just make a model in a motion that um, doesn't have ground reaction forces. So I guess I'm going to assume that you mean you'd like to um, you'd like to have a motion that you're analyzing, and you want to know the component that's contributed by the ground reaction force, or by the muscles, and not by the ground reaction force, and Joint reaction doesn't let you do that, like decompose different elements. And really the reason is because your, your reaction force is a force at some point that's on the joint. And your muscle forces are just that same thing. They're just forces that are applied to your model. So if you want to know what the contribution of a muscle force is to a joint reaction load, it's really just the muscle force because the reaction load is just the sum of all these reaction, these uh, muscle forces and other forces in the model. So if you wanted to know what, their, what the contribution of the quadriceps, uh, one quadriceps muscle force was to the knee load, it would be exactly just the tension in the muscle times its vector or its unit vector in that direction. So maybe I'm misinterpreting what you'd like to do, um, but if there's some kind of feature you'd like it, like it to see, why don't you uh, maybe post a question to the joint reaction project page and we can, we can talk about it. Okay, so next a question from Lucy Kang. Uh, she's wondering what the range of motion of the hip joint is and whether you can look at joint loads, I'm assuming, when it's in extreme position. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Um, 
So there's a couple ways to define joint limits, I'm going to call them, in OpenSim. Um, you can actually just specify a limit on the joint. And that can either just be a kinematic limit, so it'll never go beyond that point, where the analysis would just say you've gone outside your bounds of motion. Which is, it's also possible, and I forget the exact option, what it's called, uh, but it's possible to set limit forces on your joint. And um, those limit forces basically just turn on as soon as you hit uh, this range is really close to the limit you set. And um, there's a little bit of a, a nuance about these limit forces, and that is that um, coordinate actuators, like generalized forces and, and the forces that act, or generalized coordinates and the forces that act along generalized coordinates, um, basically are treated like part of a joint structure. So the joint limit force, if you define one, will be treated like it's part of the of the joint structure, so it will contribute to the reaction load at that joint. So you could think of it as if you hit this limit, it wouldn't be like a motor that's on your joint providing this limit force. It would instead be like the actual tissues of your joint who are applying this reaction load. Hopefully that answers the question. Okay, so the next question from Daniel Lopez. Uh, how about joint reaction analysis with contact geometries? Is that possible in open space? Yeah, it, it definitely is. Um, so it's uh, it could be a little confusing. It really this really requires uh, some really rigor rigorous modeling uh, practices to do this. Um, basically, a contact force. So contact if you define contact geometries and or contact meshes, uh, and you and you have these contact forces applied. Those contact forces actually are body forces. They're forces applied to the tibia body or the femoral body and such. So those forces will be incorporated in the joint reaction analysis. So you saw that there were points where we're uh, applying constraint loads and other body forces, and then we're subtracting all those applied loads from the inertial forces. So what that means is you'll have two components of the joint load now, and you'll need to collect those on your own. You'll have the joint reaction load um, covering whatever all the other applied loads don't cover. So you'll have muscle forces pulling the body around. You'll have um, contact geometry is kind of constraining that motion. And then whatever work the contact geometry isn't doing to constrain the motion, that'll be taken up by the joint definition that's like just the geometry of the model, and that will be the contribution of a reaction load. So if you want to know the work done or the effort of the, the joint tissues to restraining motion, you'd have to actually take some kind of sum of the, of the contact forces and the joint reaction load to get like the result, the total result of the joint tissues. Okay, so next a question from Carolyn Stolte. Uh, are joint loads, joint load calculations compromised for muscles that wrap around joints? Uh, sometimes muscles appear to go through joints at full flexion or extension. Hmm, that's, a, that's a really good point. So your joint loads are only as good as the definition of your model. Um, they, if, you're, if, you're joint, if your joint structure that you define in the model is bad, your reaction loads will be bad. And also, if your muscle geometry is bad, or the muscle distribution you saw for is bad, you'll get bad joint reaction load. Uh, one thing I want to point out, though, is that just because you see a muscle moving through the bones in OpenSim doesn't mean that it's actually moving through a joint, for example. It's, those bones are just visualizing geometry. They don't have any purpose for the calculations that are, in, that are going on in the background in OpenSim. They're just for you to see, for human people to read uh, what is going on. So maybe you have like a penetration of, of this geometry of the muscle, but really your joints not being penetrated. So I would take a look at that. But you're right, if you have complicated musculature and it's, and it's crossing a joint and it's transitioning from being a flexor to an extensor, for example, um, you need to make sure that the muscle is doing exactly that. So maybe you should be editing the muscle points and making sure that they're applying loads exactly how you want them to. Okay. Since we have a couple minutes left, um, there have been a couple questions about static optimization. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So Mark Weston asks um, whether you could talk through the role of residual actuators in static optimization and how they relate to the underlying physiology of the model. <laughs> um, this is a this is a complicated question, um, and you're right. We didn't really talk about static optimization. And maybe there should really be a more rigorous 
discussion maybe in another webinar or another um, in another an online, online video. video maybe mm -hmm. something like that. We could produce an online video on estimating muscle forces, and that's kind of a better place to talk about residuals. They're actually um, it's it's I think we should really dedicate some time to talking about how static optimization works if we're going to talk about why it needs residuals. But um, in a nutshell, in one sentence answer, I'd say they don't represent physiology at all. They represent the conventions of our model. And that convention is that we start with the pelvis joint and then have a tree structure away from it. So what happens is we have a joint, a ground pelvis joint, but it's unactuated. It has no muscles that can pull it around in space. So if we want to match the kinematics of the pelvis, uh, we need to have some extra actuators that can take up the air or the slop uh, of this pelvis kind of not matching the kinematics we measured in the lab. And that's why they're there. But you're right, it's a wonder if they're physiological. They obviously aren't. We're not wearing jetpacks that are zooming us around the lab. So maybe we should do a more um, rigorous discussion maybe in a downloadable video for this. Yeah, that's a good idea. Uh, so since we have a couple more minutes, we'll take one more question uh, that's somewhat related. So Pauline Bruce asks, what's the difference between calculating joint reaction forces using the muscle forces that you estimate with static optimization mm -hmm. versus uh, CMC, for example? Sure. In terms of the way it's calculated in the background, um, in, like this conceptual walkthrough we did, it's exactly the same. Um, you're still taking external loads and kinematics in a model and muscle forces and using those to calculate joint loads. There are a few different options in the Analyze tool for how you can specify CMC data to input into the joint reactions. Um, but for now, you can do it exactly the same way you do static optimization. You can provide kinematics that CMC produces, and you can provide the forces for all the actuators and muscles in that same forces file. And that'll, do exact, that'll calculate exactly the same way that, that static optimization does. There are some other easier ways to interface joint reactions with simulations like CMC or maybe forward tool simulations, but we'll spend time in the documents to kind of explain that to you. Um, we need a little more time for that, but we'll publish some documents about how to, just like we did for static optimization with a checklist to go from static optimization to joint reactions, do the same thing for CMC and how to go from CMC to joint reactions. And so you can hopefully uh, help yourself along that. All right, so thank you for a great discussion. Thanks for answering all those questions, Matt. Uh, in closing, we ask again that you complete the informational survey that's going to appear in a pop-up window once you exit the event. Uh, this will help us improve the webinars and choose the upcoming topics. You'll receive a follow-up email that will have links to the additional um, information and materials that we talked about. Uh, thank you all for participating, and we hope that you'll continue to attend these webinars and stay involved with OpenSim. Thank you.